Seeing mixed-race children among the children of black slaves confused white women. They knew that the children of the male and female black slaves they owned had to be black. Yet who were these mixed-race children with slightly lighter skin tones? That was when they discovered the sexual relationships their white husbands had engaged in with black slaves. Using threats and fear, their white husbands treated the black slaves as property with which they could do anything. However, little did they know that their white wives were thinking of doing the same to punish their husbands. Since white women owned slaves, most of whom were black men, they thought of something repulsive. What horrible and disgusting acts would white women commit that continue to shame white men to this day? Let's learn more about this in this video from the Black History Archive. Curiously, there are few accounts detailing the involvement of white women in slavery, and this was intentionally done to avoid the shame that haunts white men to this day. White women actively participated in the slave economy rather than merely observing from the sidelines. They were involved in the buying, selling, and owning of slaves, with about 40% of slave owners being white women. The more slaves a woman owned, the more influence and authority she wielded. Therefore, fathers often bequeathed more slaves than land to their daughters, closely tying slave ownership to the identity of Southern white women. This was because, after marriage, land would go to their husbands, but the slaves were usually kept by the women. Before the Civil War, American white women faced considerable restrictions on their freedoms. They were denied the right to vote and were effectively absorbed into their husband's authority upon marriage, essentially becoming their husband's property. Their mobility and freedom were severely restricted, often controlled through abuse, Despite enduring mistreatment and infidelities, women were expected to maintain a cheerful, obedient, and loyal demeanor. They actively participated in the slave trade, owning multiple slaves to maintain their social status. Legal battles were fought to retain slave ownership, with many white women prevailing in court due to the belief that slavery equaled freedom. While historians previously downplayed the role of white women in slavery, recent research has provided a more detailed understanding. Accounts collected through initiatives like the Federal Writers Project shed light on the lived experiences of black individuals. These narratives reveal that white girls were indoctrinated from a young age into the practices of controlling and owning enslaved people. This deeply ingrained mindset perpetuated the cycle of slavery across successive generations in the pre-war South. Many young women learned about social norms from close family members, including female relatives like cousins, friends, mothers, and grandmothers. They understood that when they acquired property, it would typically be transferred to their husbands upon marriage, unless they took proactive steps to retain control. Thus, these young women were taught the importance of safeguarding their wealth, regardless of their husband's future abilities. As white women reached maturity and became eligible to own slaves, their elevated social status granted them significant authority over these individuals. This allowed them to exert control over the lives of those they owned, sometimes resorting to verbal or physical exploitation. Southern households sought to mimic the hierarchical structure of slave society, desiring to acquire more servants at reduced costs. Growing up during this era, white girls witnessed their parents exercising control over their black slaves and learned to imitate their behavior. They were taught to adopt a strategic and calculated approach, fully understanding the consequences of their actions. Historical sources vividly illuminate life during that time. For instance, the book They Were Her Property recounts cases like that of Lizzie Anab Burwell, a three-year-old girl who demanded that her father harm a black slave and acquire new maids for her. Parents often granted additional slaves to their daughters, effectively transferring ownership to them. By subscribing to our channel and liking the video, we aim to build a strong community, and we need your support. Let's continue now.
Legally, married women were not recognized as property owners due to the doctrine of coverture, which merged the legal identity of married couples under the husband's authority. However, despite women's limited legal and political position, they employed various strategies to assert control over property, including prenuptial agreements before marriage and legal instruments such as trust deeds and gifts. In Louisiana, women could establish separate marital estates if their husbands demonstrated improved financial management. Essentially, the pre-war South operated under two concurrent systems, a patriarchal structure and a framework that granted white women legal and financial influence, despite the limitations imposed by coverture. Southern families found ways to bypass or ignore these limitations, allowing women to exercise power over property and, consequently, over their black slaves. During the 19th century, a misconception prevailed about white women, portraying them as delicate and protected individuals, confined to the home and shielded from the harsh realities of the outside world. However, historical evidence from various sources refutes this notion, revealing the active participation of white women in the slave markets of that time. Despite the prevalence of slavery, women participated in the buying and selling of black slaves, often arranging transactions within their local social circles from the comfort of their own homes. Due to their significant influence, white women played a crucial role in shaping a distinct market for enslaved wet nurses. Some felt compelled to separate black women from their families to care for their own children. Reports suggest that white women, particularly those who had frequent childbirths, viewed enslaved black women as a solution to alleviate their domestic burdens. Depending on their financial status, white women had the flexibility to hire, borrow, or purchase enslaved wet nurses, allowing them the freedom to socialize while others cared for their newborns. Unfortunately, not all white women treated their slaves with compassion. Some displayed extreme brutality, requiring the intervention of their husbands. Wealthy white women often invested in enslaved men and women to exploit them for reproductive purposes, thereby increasing their slave population. Historical records document cases where white women forced black male slaves into sexual relations. Although the nature of these relationships varied, they typically involved coercion, manipulation, and the inherent power imbalances in the master-slave dynamic. Some white female slave owners engaged in sexual relationships with their black male slaves to assert dominance and control. They used their position as slave owners to pressure or force the slaves into sexual encounters, exploiting their vulnerability and lack of autonomy. These relationships were often non-consensual and driven by the white women's desire for power and personal satisfaction. But here's something to pay attention to. During slavery, black slaves were not considered human and were therefore not allowed to approach or touch their white masters. The contempt was too great. However, curiously, white women ignored this contempt due to their sexual desires. Black slaves were not only allowed to approach, but also to touch and have sexual relations with white women, showing a completely different side. Some white slaveholders maintained sexual relationships with black slaves to satisfy their desires or seek companionship. Although there may have been cases of genuine affection or emotional attachment, these relationships were fundamentally unequal, shaped by the racial hierarchies of the time. The nature of these relationships led to various activities depending on the circumstances. Some encounters took place in secret, hidden from public view due to the social taboo surrounding interracial relationships. There were secret rooms where white women would go and call black slaves to be with them. However, in other cases, these relationships were more overt white women openly took black slaves as sexual partners or even maintained long-term romantic relationships with them. Regardless of the details, 
it is crucial to recognize that these relationships were deeply rooted in the exploitation and dehumanization inherent in the institution of slavery. They exemplify the broader system of oppression that allowed white slave owners to dominate the bodies and lives of black people, perpetuating a legacy of trauma and injustice that continues to affect society today. Sexual exploitation represented a heartbreaking aspect of the abuses suffered by black slaves, often inflicted by wealthy white women. Despite the prevailing idea that white women were passive or innocent, there were cases where they actively coerced black slaves into non-consensual sexual encounters, taking advantage of their authority and domination. This reprehensible behavior perpetuated a vicious cycle of sexual violence and degradation, further dehumanizing the already oppressed. The autobiography of Harriet Jacob, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, offers a raw example of this type of exploitation, detailing how the daughters of plantation owners exploited vulnerable black slaves under their control for sexual gratification. Jacob's account highlights the predatory nature of this behavior, which cannot be interpreted as consensual, but rather as sexual abuse. It underscores the widespread sexual control exercised by plantation mistresses and elite white women, reflecting the actions of their male counterparts. Additionally, white women employed threats of false rape accusations to impose their dominance over slaves and force them to comply with their desires. Several factors may have motivated this sexual exploitation, ranging from boredom or sexual frustration to an unconscious attempt to compensate for their lack of agency in other aspects of their lives. Considered their husband's property, plantation women faced significant limitations on their sexual autonomy compared to men. Sexually exploiting slaves may have provided them with a semblance of power and control in a society where they lacked agency. The lives of plantation mistresses were often marked by loneliness, sadness, and limited freedom. Married at a young age and left to fend for themselves on the plantations while their husbands were away, they struggled with isolation and sought ways to exercise control over their limited lives. Furthermore, the expectation of remaining obedient despite their husband's infidelities with slaves compounded their suffering. In essence, Southern women were disguised prisoners, trapped by social norms and patriarchal structures that relegated them to subordinate roles. Establishing sexual relationships with strong black slaves allowed them to enjoy their lives and silently punish their husbands. After the Civil War ended, many white women tried to maintain control over working conditions by negotiating with newly freed blacks. One strategy they employed was taking the children of these young African Americans as apprentices. Although apprenticeship was considered an improvement over slavery, it fell short of offering true freedom. Former slaves often worked under the same master or mistress as before, with meager wages and a predetermined period of service. Many apprentices ended up serving the same people who had once owned them, resulting in minimal improvements in their overall quality of life. What do you think? Why do you believe white women engaged in such unpleasant actions with their black slaves? Was it to feel a sense of authority or to seek a better sexual life because their white husbands often lacked what black slaves possessed? In the comments section below, share your thoughts on whether similar practices exist today with slight differences. Would you like us to create more videos? If so, Support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell icon. You can also watch more videos on our channel 